Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Cosmic Echo, a Tay Leaders podcast. I'm Matt. He's Lee. Hey, everyone. And uh, today we'll be interviewing James W. Gesso. Um, he's a content producer. Um, he, his, uh, his, his podcast is Adventure to the Minds, and, and he has uh, quite a wide variety of topics. And we, we discuss, we, we kind of have a casual conversation with him in this, in this episode. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Cosmic Echoes. I'm Matt. He's Lee. We're here with uh, James W. Gesso with the Adventures Through the Mind podcast. Um, we're here and uh, we got some questions for him. He has a wealth of information on his site, uh, jameswgesso.com. Is that right? Jameswgesso.com. Yes. It's cool. Um, and we're going to get right into the interview. Uh, Lee, won't you, won't you start us off? So, uh, James, why don't you give us a little bit of background about um, what you do with your website as well as your podcast, writings, lectures. Um, I'm particularly interested in lectures. So, um, well, um, I'd say generally what I do is mostly wonder about stuff aloud um, <laughs> and for the public record. And uh, a lot of the times what I'm wondering about is... Uh, is the implications or the potentials and possibilities around psychedelics oftentimes focused on psilocybin because uh, that's been a big one for me but uh, psychedelics in general and being that psychedelics are um, they lack any real impact without the the you know the the, the sacred partner of the mind you know these molecules what, what do they even mean to any human whatsoever if they are not interacting with the human mind in some way which means to wonder about psychedelics is also to wonder about the nature of mind and why we experience things the way that we do and um sort of the a whole series of questions around around that around the nature of who we are and and our experience and what might be the disposition of experience and of the human mind that leads to whatever it is that psychedelics offer us and how the interaction in the two can be fine-tuned or formulated towards say generally specific outcomes and then there's the question of how does the mind grapple with the implications of what is encountered during a psychedelic experience, which is often very different than what the sort of narrow bandwidth of experience for the average human in the modern world today um, might be. And those are some of the questions, I guess, that I, that's what I do with my site. I mean, if I were to go just like really general, you know, I'm, I do a yeah. podcast and I write stuff and <laughs> I talk about things and periodically I go on, you know, like, sojourns to other places to to wonder about things to crowds of people nice yeah i i heard you were going um you're going to be traveling soon giving some lectures i guess yeah just in a few days actually i'm in the i'm in the mad dash to get things organized to leave my leave my zone for a few weeks okay. nice um what are some of those like uh how, how do those lectures take place like what are your um specific topics kind of that you kind of dive into with those lectures and like your age group kind of that um that show up mm. well the age group is always dependent on um, the scenario i guess uh but oftentimes i'm giving lectures in in, in four possible varieties of places one of which is at a festival um Another of which is at a conference of some type, which ranges from more academic conferences to less academic conferences. Uh, another type would be in an in-city event where people contact me to come to their city and speak to their community. And then the third would be, um, I don't, like I do sometimes, but I don't do very often, would just be to smaller groups of people who are my friends to um, explore and sort of like sample my BS and see if it smells right. <laughs> uh, 
and and it ranges um, from you know younger people, 16, 17, through my age group, um, which is I, I'm 32. So basically, ranging from 16 up to uh, people in middle age um, and older who who come. I mean, I think this is a this is a relevant topic for people of all ages because being that psychedelics in general affect, like I said, it impacts the mind, the mind of a 15 year old uh, and the mind of a 70 year old are very different minds. Um, I mean, you know, neurodegenerative disorders notwithstanding, even if like full cognitive capacities are still there, mm -hmm. it's a very different experience to trip psychedelics when you're this close to, you know, what is reasonable to say to death's door than you would be at 17 or at least biologically. I mean, Every one of us is, uh, we don't know how, we don't know when the second half of our life started or will start. You know, oh, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so there's relevance there uh, insofar as age groups. Insofar as topics, um, often the topics obviously focus around psychedelics, but they change every year um, and expand. My questions evolve and they sort of spiral. They spiral out and then back in at new levels of complexity and out and back in. And um, so I've sp spoken about things like, you know, how can we use psilocybin mushrooms to, um, to, in a part of our personal development practice, mm -hmm. spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, as well as talked about, you know, what might be the role of psychedelics in trauma resolution. I've also talked about the impact of food on how we, like what we eat and how we experience reality. and. I've also talked about, um, I think it was last year, I talked about intergenerational trauma and mm. healing intergenerational trauma. Um, I did one year, I was talking about the potentials for conscious relationships in cultivating psycho-spiritual maturity. Um, and then this year, uh, oh, I've also given super heady talks about the nature of reality, <laughs> psychedelics as cognitive enhancers for self-awareness. Uh, but this year I'm talking primarily on um, the relationship between um, psilocybin use and the cultivation of compassion inside of a larger framework of, of um, early childhood conditioning, early childhood trauma, and the manifestation of early childhood trauma in adult psychological um, behaviors and tendencies and, and patterns of perception, as well as discussions around uh, another talk that I'll be giving. I think I'm only giving this one once in that sci-fi festival um, around, um, well, it's called, I'll just give you the name of it, something along the lines of um, ritualistic suffering, psychedelics, and the meaning of life. Um, okay. So sort of like a sort of psych psychedelic, a psychedelic solution to existentialism or something. <laughs> awesome. Um, so that's, I'm always just curious about staying within, you know, my general mode of what I'm curious about, mm -hmm. what I think is impactful and has been impactful for me, but uh, also venturing out and not being afraid to be like, oh, you know what? A year ago, I thought this idea was correct and I knew it. Mm -hmm. And now in hindsight, it actually seems almost fundamentally incorrect or just no longer relevant to the, to the discussion at hand and being willing to say like, mm, yeah, I just, I don't think that anymore. I change, yeah. I grow, I learn. So, so yeah, I like to keep things fresh, but also tying everything back into my larger body of work. Interesting that, yeah. Um, I was looking at some of your videos and stuff and it definitely seemed like you were implying that psychedelics were um, generally a, can be used as a medicine versus like um, just trying to have trips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a potential um, for sure. And then they could also be used just to have trips and there could be some, you know, some, some value there. Um, and there definitely has been value there for me. I think um, the, the goal or say the, the intention to explore novel states of mind simply to map them and bring them back for, for curious exploration amongst your, amongst your compadres in this, in, in, in this radical journey, you know, of, of, ex, of exploring, exploring the seas of the mind, like the, the unmapped seas of the mind. I think there's a lot of value there. 
um, it's also it's it's not the most like um, media savvy for the reintegration of psychedelics in the modern world, mm-hmm. um, and it might not, in so far as, we'll say our 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 modern social value system, it might not mark as high, on the necessity scale as say. <laughs> curing depression or post-traumatic stress disorder or nicotine addiction um, or end stage life anxiety, which is a, which is a huge, a very huge issue in our, in our culture or mm-hmm. modern own culture. Uh, but, you know, the exploration simply for the sake of exploration, I think has value too. Um, I think there's some more pitfalls there about getting confused and getting lost. Um, but there's still value. I think. Definitely. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I've been thinking about this a lot lately here at Cosmic Echo. We, we primarily talk about, you know, altered states of consciousness, primarily through like, you know, dreams and lucid dreaming and, and, and all the, you know, altered states of awareness that we, we have, that everybody has. Um, but psychedelics is, uh, in psychedelic experiences is, is kind of a strange one to get across from somebody who hasn't had one. Um, it's like, it's, Talking about, you know, uh, the nature of reality seems strange to the average person who, you know, th- he's always like, oh, reality is reality. You know, we, we got one, one reality. So it's, tr- it's, very, it's very strange to talk about something that you experienced in isolation through a psychedelic experience as, a, and, you know, a trip or something like that as real whenever somebody has a narrow definition of reality. How, how do you... How do you, in general, broach this this subject with somebody that isn't uh, familiar with with these kind of things? Hmm. Well, um, it would be unfair to generalize because every person's different, and in order to get something across to another person, in order to explain something in a way that another person can understand, you have to meet that other person where they're at. Um, and that said. I also, I generally do pretty, <clears throat> pretty good to do that. And then on another level, it's like, if they still don't understand, that's not really my problem. <laughs> um, you know, go think about it for a little while. Uh, so, but if I were to generalize, which I don't think is accurate, I would say that, um, yeah, that uh, a psychedelic experience is, almost like a waking dream where yeah i would say it's it's almost like being in a waking dream but an added sense of everything being extra meaningful and extra impactful Um, and often the content that emerges is directly relevant to a person's say underlying psychological patterns Hmm the why underneath why we do things and why we perceive things the way that we do. And that in exploring those experiences such as these, there could be great benefit to how we conduct ourselves in the world, um, which would be, I'd say that's a general way. Yeah. But it, it, it is difficult for sure. It's like trying to explain to someone who's, who's, um, who's, who ne- has never had, you know, heterosexual sex, what it's like to, press your penis inside the vagina yeah you know you can you're like i you know i don't know or or, or something along those lines it's like trying to describe to someone who's um who's never exercised a day in their life what it's like to be in that peak state of runner's high yeah or or why it feels good to feel like you're gonna throw up or something you know so it it, it is difficult to explain and in some degree you never will um you can only hope to align their curiosity and their wondering with some sliver of, 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 of palpable connection to what it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, and using language as, as the, as the, as the, as the, as the means to do that. Um, but ultimately without the experience, it would be impossible to know. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. It's nice that you say like, there's there's a, a a language that we can we can use for for other people like some, something accepted like uh, I notice you you use like kind of Jungian Carl Jungian you know uh, terminology for like the shadow self the ego that kind of thing and those are those are like pretty widely accepted um, states of you know internal 
you know, processing of information and like, you know, the subconscious and stuff like that. So that that's why I just broached the subject. Like, is, is there like a, a method that you use to be like, hey, you know, your shadow self is, you know, could be attributed to these kinds of, you know, uh, internal subconscious dialogues that you have. Yeah, I definitely, um, I definitely use sort of, I, I, I effort towards common language. One of my uh, favorite teachers, um, or I, I look up to him as a, as a teacher for me, is Stephen Jenkinson. And uh, he says something along the lines of he, he, he explains things with um, nickel words. And, and uh, even though he's got lots of $64,000 words hanging around, mm -hmm. you know, what is really the value of that in a conversation when you're trying to explain something to someone? Um, that said, I love throwing around poetic language that slightly confuses in a way that's impactful, like it confuses in the direction of understanding. Mm. Uh, and also, I, I reach to the stuff that has strong explanatory value um, for a wider reach without, you know, eliminating necessary um, elements for the sake of explanatory value to a wider audience. But things like the shadow, yeah, definitely, it's really easy to grasp. It's like really, I think the word I'm looking for here is like salient um, for for the modern discourse around you know the experience of ourselves and of, of our of our mind and, and of other people um and so it, it has a lot of value there plus i think Jungian stuff is awesome and it's really <laughs> yeah definitely yeah james um i have a question so for you why why psychedelics why um why is that so much of a passion of yours to teach people to write about it to seems like it's integrated in pretty much everything that you do in life. Hmm. Well, is it because I'm wearing this hike for a second? No, man. I mean, you're uh, lovely, this is an interesting you know, character. That I, I like I like the little, what is that, like a lion or a, a panther? I guess. A friend of mine uh, made it for me. Anyways, it's let's not talk, cool. about, okay. not talk about my shirt. I was just saying. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I could probably explain to you a bunch of, a series of events you know that might work as a to create a causal chain or, or or a causal web that has you know sort of yeah i mean what's what's your story yeah. around me um yeah. i mean my 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 story is a long one but let, let's just say that at some point in time in my life psychedelics found their way in and the resulting confusion delirium and awestruck ignorance that came as a consequence of that um, left me who left it la landed in my life in a way that uh, has been very positive in the sense that it has really contributed to a direction of, of, of investigation and um, that has led me to where I am and why it was that it was psychedelics for me and and not um, and not uh, nutrigenomics, like, I don't, I don't know, or 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 or, or physics or something. It's yeah, that's that's a, a long thing, a long thing to unpack. But I guess it just landed, it landed for me. I mean, maybe we'll call it um, a strange grace or magic or <laughs> something. I mean, did they, did they kind of help you through um, some type of suffering or anything like that? And like, I mean, I've. I got into psychedelics on accident pretty much. I was studying dreams and um, wanted to find the relationship between dreams and and um, specifically DMT. And through that, um, what I realized is that I had a lot of underlying trauma that kind of needed <laughs> taken care of and um, didn't expect that to happen. So, I mean, is that something that kind of applies to your life as well through your experiences? Yeah, yeah, I see. I see you're you're you're, you're uh, kind of fit, you're fishing for a specific uh, a specific area of of answering. So I'll I'll, I'll bite. Okay. So um, yeah, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I was curious about um, things like lucid dreaming, and um, as we got a little bit older, meditation, and 
as a con I think that was a, a, a consequence of um, my like a lot of nightmares that I suffered from as a kid and trying to figure out what that all meant and um, there's more on, to unpack I think about how my parents lived and their dynamic with the world that influenced the way that I show up and you know ponder um, my experience but I ended up getting into psychedelics when I was like 15. I got into taking mushrooms when I was like 15, 16, which, you know, the wow factor is equal for a 16 year old as it is for a 70 year old, um, as it would have been for the, for the monkeys, uh, you know, like however many hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. Um, but if we objectively, the content was very simple then compared to you know, yeah. what it might be now, uh, or for a 70 year old, I wouldn't know I'm only 30. Right. So, uh, but I ended up getting pretty deep into psychedelics in my early twenties and a lot of use, frequent use of basically anything. I got very curious, like, what are these things? Like, where can I go? And just really, um, hedonistic pleasure in just getting completely fucking altered mm -hmm. um sorry i don't can i <laughs> no, swear cool. yeah. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead <laughs> completely fucking altered in whatever way is possible without really having any sort of elderhood or, or older guidance or because the type of guidance i had for drug use before this was something along the lines of don't do it they're bad <laughs> yeah. so um i didn't and turns out that that's not entirely true uh so so i didn't really have a lot of that i got myself really confused and very ill um as a consequence of that type of lifestyle which at some point i ended up you know wanting to no longer feel confused and ill i even there's a video on my YouTube where I talk about um, a psychotic episode that I had, like or, uh, yeah. a, a psychosis that I went through as a consequence of mostly amphetamine use, which, you know, tripping psychedelics got into taking other things, got into pretty strict amphetamine use for a little while. Um, but without zooming in too deep on anything, I ended up, you know, on the other end of this, of this, um, substance use um and yes yeah, substance use problem that i had and i was mostly controlling myself at that point but then i was all broken still and i didn't mm. know what to do with it and in some strange serendipitous you know thing that came up in my mind it was like oh you know what might be a good way to recover from all this drug use taking more drugs <laughs> no but but I actually thought you know I was listening to a lot of Terrence McKenna at the time and mm. um, I was reading Baba Ramdas uh, formerly Richard Alpert be here now is his big book I was, oh, yeah, I was yeah. reading these these guys and getting a lot about ayahuasca at the time and thinking so maybe maybe the it's what's that old saying um, the hair of the dog it's like a shot of whiskey in the morning is the best way to recover from a whiskey hangover. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's terrible. That's I, I'm not standing behind that. Yeah. I mean, it, it does kind of work from my experience, but it's not the best choice. Um, so I, I ended up thinking like, okay, so maybe there is value here. And I just missed it. I misused them. Mm -hmm. So I trusted, I got to a point where I decided the mushrooms were the way I would go. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I did my best. And over the course, like the, the intensive work that I was doing was once a month, every month for 13 months in the full moon, I took um, about like between two and a half to four and a half grams, um, okay. starting smaller and, and getting bigger. And just asked myself, like, what, you know, what do I need to heal? What do I need to heal? And then between each month, I would have the experience, I would, have the experience and then I'd be integrating that experience reflecting on it thinking about it writing about it letting it land in my life while also gearing myself up for the next for the next month I remember even when I was I was 20 this is when I was 23 late maybe 24 yeah about about 24 um, and I got hired at this this uh, cafe when I, I moved to Calgary and um, we were talking in the hiring process in the interview. And I said, oh, 
uh, if you hire me, I need to have the night of and day after every full moon off because I have uh, I have a religious practice that includes eating psychedelic mushrooms under the full oh, moon. Whoa. And she just looked at me for a second. She was like, yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, I think that might have been one of the reasons that they hired me because they're like, this guy's interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, that was the process. After the 13 months, a lot of what would become my first book, Decomposing the Shadow, and the foundation of my work since there was established. Um, and I got really curious. I, I was like, wow, this, these mushrooms helped me. I came out on the other side of that a little new aging, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. a little idealistic, a little too heavy on the love and light vibe. Um, but also at the same time, I felt like I had really come to recognize the value of processing my dark emotions um, and really got, I, maybe not the love and light vibe, but the ascension vibe mm -hmm. <laughs> a little yeah. bit, okay. um, which is funny because it might not be reflected in the book so much, but it was reflected in, in my work. It was almost like a future me was like, don't put that stuff in there. You won't stand behind it. <laughs> you know, in, in a few years Things time. are going to change. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so that, that was the, that was the foundation. I was, I felt like I had discovered something valuable about, about how to work with the mushrooms and their potential that I didn't see anywhere else. Now it's, really ripe and relevant all over the place now. But in 2011, when I started writing this book, it wasn't really anywhere, not anywhere that I could see it, not mm -hmm. discussions like this. There might have been, you know, a couple books giving modern language to working with the mushrooms in a, in a, in a sacred and sort of psychologically informed way, um, but not really. So I felt like it was, I mean, this sounds really like, messianic or something it was like my mission you know it was yeah, my mission yeah. to deliver the words of the mushrooms onto the people because i saw it's positive like the positive impact it was having on my community um, as they as i shared my ideas with them mm -hmm. and also because during a trip the mushrooms were like write a book <laughs> like really write a book I'm like okay 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 mushroom um and uh yeah i mean i i've, I've obviously like that was it's I wrote yeah decomposing the shadow came out in 2013 so that was five years ago I've grown up a lot since then obviously mm -hmm. um but that was that was what informed sort of the initial exploration it was very much like I'm broken uh-oh <laughs> how do I get better um and managed to get better and psychedelics were a part of that getting an, an essential integral part of that getting better and in some way I felt like um, I had to tell the world. That's a very early 20s kind of thing. I need to tell everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got the answer. Uh, but then, you know, it just it just stuck around. I continue to just grow with it. And psychedelics are interwoven with a lot of what I do now, of course. I mean, that's the that's the main sort of niche. That's the that's the branded hook or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the work has really ex expanded a lot into things that have little, seemingly little to nothing to do with psychedelics, um, mm -hmm. intergenerational trauma, dying relationships, um, uh, early childhood developmental conditioning and its impact on mental health and adulthood. If I don't say psychedelics in that, you wouldn't think psychedelics when I say that. Mm -hmm. But if I start to explain to you how psychedelics are related, then it'll make you know, obvious sense. It's like, oh, of course, you know, but... Um, the work has expanded a lot. Interesting, yeah. Um, what is your, I mean, sounds like a lot of what you deal with is mental health um, and maybe depression. What is kind of your take on that, I guess, um, from your experiences with um, your community that you've kind of connected to? Like, um, you know, there's a typical view of depression um, being uh, chemical, emotional, but um, kind of want to hear maybe what you have to think about that. What is my view on mental health and depression? Pardon me for a second while I prepare you a three hour lecture. <laughs> uh, so I'd say that my, my view is that um, these things have a subjective root cause that has, um, that is connected with 
like I said the terminology a few times now, a, a chain of causal events mm. that have come before us, things that were set in motion long before we were born. Even, I mean, if we want to go really deep, long before our parents were born or our grandparents, a causal chain that ripples back all the way into our ancestry. It's like, why are like you guys are in the United States or in Canada? Yeah, United States, yeah. Right? So you both look Caucasian. What the hell are you <laughs> yeah. doing in North America? You know, it's yeah. like, why did you immigrate there? Chances are, I don't know you, but I assume that you didn't come just to own slaves and, and kill natives. Oh, no. You probably came because you were fleeing something from the countries that you were originally from, which likely is a consequence of the Roman Christian conquest at some point. But like, point is, is that it goes all the way back. But just to bring it close to home, something set us up to have a certain inner disposition that creates the inclination towards patterns of perception and behavior um, and, pa and behavior including who we interact with um, that rests inside of the way things are that we can't control that are beyond our behavior and that the interaction between these things creates a level of chronic stress and degradation that would become mental illness. And there's correlations of physical factors and epigenetic factors and genetic um, in inherited genetic factors, of course, although I believe that those things are correlations, direct correlations, not causations, um, with subjective factors. And this isn't to say that it's not real, it's just in the mind. You know, it's like saying, um, you know, like, uh, oh, I'm in love. No, you're not. It's just in the mind. Yeah. You know, I'm feeling really fucking aroused right now. No, you're not. It's just in your mind. You're like, no, it's not just in my mind. Um, <laughs> but anyways, it, what I'm getting at here is that if my suggestion is that if that's the case, which I believe that it is, then there is a possibility to shift that as a consequence of shifting our subjective sense of self and experience, which can be done with psychedelics. And although it's correlated with physical um, neurobiological things, um, and we can go the direction of altering neurobiological things to alter subjective things, if the subjective root of the issue is not resolved, then, then it, it's almost like just pulling up, like just like cutting off a dandelion and being like, I'll just make sure that I keep cutting it so that I don't have dandelions in my yard, but it does absolutely nothing to change the fact that that root is deep in the, in the nitrogen rich pet compacted soil, mm -hmm. trying to, trying to fix something, you know, the depression is actually the manifestation. Your symptoms are, are a manifestation of your body trying to tell you something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Anyway, so this is where psychedelics can come in. And I also, and this is you know, looking at my own experience and looking at the research, with depression, it's often looked at as a brain disease and absolutely right. an issue with the brain there. But if we look at it exclusively as a brain disease, we're going to make the mistake of thinking that there's a physical thing that we need to treat with a physical thing. We need to, there's a problem with the brain that problem looks like serotonin depletion. Right. Let's put more serotonin in. Oh, depression goes away. The symptoms of depression go away. Problem solved. Yeah. But not really. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a lot of suggestion, too, that the, the, the uh, monoamine theory of depression is not actually accurate, um, that it has to do with neuroplasticity and it has to do with um, BDNF and the capacity for the brain to like grow new neural new neuronal connections for the hippocampus to function properly. Um, and it has, you know, it's a consequence of chronic stress. And I feel like I'm getting into muddy waters here, <laughs> um, going a little bit out to sea. And I don't, I don't want to do that too much because I haven't prepared to answer this question clearly. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's, that's where I'm coming from in, in regards to mental illness. And I just, I want to be clear that I, that this isn't a simplistic answer. It's like you just got to okay. change your mind. That would be um, arrogant and, and ignorant, ignorant for me to say. But what I'm suggesting is that there's a deep subjective root um, from which mental illness blossoms. Mm -hmm. 
and there are a series of, of physical, social, psychological, maybe spiritual, um, and emotional correlates mm. that are around that. Um, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, I had chronic depression pretty much the majority of my life, um, up into my mid twenties when I started, um, diving into, um, ayahuasca as well as like other hallucinogens. And, um, what I found is my depression went away, but it wasn't primarily just because I took drugs, you know, it was because, um, I was able to incorporate some of those uh, lessons from the experiences as well as, um, reflecting on, uh, my own life and figuring out, you know, what the meaning of my life is and why maybe depression was there. But ultimately, I don't know what fixed it. You know, it just kind of, it kind of went away through um, that process. So I get what you're saying. It's not just like a, a simple thing that you just take a pill for, you know, like you can do psychedelics or you can do mushrooms and then your depression just magically goes away. You know, it doesn't work like that, I don't think. And it sounds like that you're on uh, pay, you're on the same page with that, I guess. Similar pages anyways. I mean, we haven't really had much chance to dive into right. the yeah. of it, but yeah, it's, and that, that's a good point um, that I, I didn't make explicitly clear. If, if depression were a problem with um, like just a simple issue that we just needed to take a drug to fix, well, it wouldn't be an epidemic. Right. Um, and if psychedelics were the we'll just say mushrooms if all we had to do was take mushrooms and our depression went away well we wouldn't have people who take psychedelics also feeling depressed yeah. you know it, there wouldn't require if, if psychedelics inherently just made you a better person happier healthier you know like a better dad you know, <laughs> a more a more you know supportive sister or whatever you know like if if that were the case then we'd be in a, a much better way in this world. If it were the case that psychedelics made people fundamentally better, then why the hell didn't the 60s result in the, in the utopia that they were shooting for? You know? um, and with so many millions of people around the world taking psychedelics, why are we in such a goddamn mess? Right? Yeah. The, they're really dependent on a specific context and that context is how we look at them, how we integrate them, um, what we are seeking to get out of them, the social context in which we use them. Um, there's a lot of nuances to fine tune and how we fine tune those nuances will influence how, what the impact is on who we are and how we conduct ourselves in the world. Uh, and a lot of my work is around exploring how to call in these bigger, more mature questions. Not to say that I'm more mature than others or anything. I'm not necessarily making that claim. But um, I would say that, you know, how can, um, how can my psilocybin experience contribute to my relationship to my inevitable death is a little bit more of a mature question than how can I you know, how many mushrooms should I take to get super off my head? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, or, or just like, you know, um, why do I, why do I see this pattern everywhere? Well, I, I don't want to go there. I think there's something of something to be said about metaphysical questioning, but to call, to call in larger, more nuanced, more mature considerations into, um, into the, you know, our, our sort of larger social or collective set around psychedelics. Definitely. Just to, I, I don't know, I guess, pivot this line of questioning uh, away from that. Uh, uh, the, the, con the concept of like context in, in terms of these psychedelic uh, cybercillian experiences and the communities that uh, revolve around these types, types of experiences. So I've noticed that they've been cropping up. Communities have been cropping up all over the place. It's, it's like becoming widely it's becoming more and more common in the in the cultural consciousness that these types of things exist. Um, me and Lee actually went to like a, a psychedelic meetup not too long ago in Seattle, and it was just like in a park, and mm. all kinds of people just showed up, but they're coming from different places, different contexts of experiences. So, 
um, it was kind of interesting to see like the people that were, you know, EDM, like tribal type people that are like, you know, there's, there's people that were, you know, part of that culture, but wanted to talk about different things, but other people wanted to be like, Hey, this is my trip. I saw, did you see, you know, the, the pink elephant or whatever, that, that kind of thing. They just want to talk about the trip and other people that were like, you know, what does this mean about, you know, the nature of reality and other people are like, Hey, these, these types of things have, you know, effects on the brain and maybe we can like, you know, neuro hack ourselves and, and create, create a more longer lasting memory or better memory or, you know, some type of neurological effect that, that is beneficial. So it's what in, in your experience, how how do you see the communities that you're involved with and uh like what are the means to find them nowadays i mean obviously you can do like a google search and be like psychedelic meetups in you know colorado or you know seattle and you you might find something but uh typically what's your what's your approach to these to finding these communities how can somebody find a community like this well, that's an excellent question. Um, and before I mention it, I want to step back a bit. Uh, or before I answer or address that question, I want to step back a bit. Something that you said there was, um, I think, really relevant to unpack a little bit about the diversity of perspective that comes into this, um, comes in when people meet around just the topic of psychedelics. And sort of going back into where I struggled with having said that I'm seeking a more mature exploration and being like oh i don't know like am i more mature than others i think and, and what you said there kind of like landed it's like that maturity comes from being able to acknowledge and explore like a nuance of perspective and to look at things from a diversity of perspectives and within that um, allow it to grow in the same way that a child moves from understanding themselves as a member of the family to understanding themselves as a citizen of the world. You know, it's like being able to bring in that diversity to create a greater maturity, like a greater sort of stronger foundation from which we can ask questions, we can take different questions and explore different considerations. And as much as I feel very confident about the direction that I'm going with my work, I don't, I also don't want to, um, unintentionally represent or accidentally embody a sort of ethnocentrism within psychedelic culture, um, while at the same time feeling confident in the value of the, of the sort of cultural angle in which I'm exploring um, that particular topic. So, or those particular topics, psychedelics as a topic. Gotcha. Um, so into finding other people, which would of course positively impact that sort of um, that progression of bringing in a diversity of, of perspective. I mean, just Googling psychedelic meetups on, you know, in whatever city you're in is definitely, um, definitely a way to do that. Although one way that I think has a positive impact socially, um, and this is one that we have to, that can be precarious and we must, uh, I think, I think a lot of times sort of be trepidatious <laughs> in, in, in moving towards, which is just talk, talking openly about it. And not like really intensely, but just like slipping little things in and assessing how people respond. Okay. Slipping little things in that sort of confidently say, oh yeah, I'm curious about psychedelics. It's like, you know, meeting new people or, or making new friends or talking with people. It's like, oh, hey, you know, What's up? Oh, I'm just reading this book on psychedelic therapy. Have you heard of psychedelic therapy? Questions yeah. like this. Yeah. And just sort of like testing the grounds, even to the point of, for example, I, I mean, at that point, I felt like I had nothing to lose. I was like, I'm fucking telling everybody <laughs> we need yeah. to destigmatize this stuff. But when I got, when I was getting hired for this job, it was like, oh yeah, by the way, I meet every full moon off because I, you know, because I have a religious ritual where I eat hallucinogenic mushrooms in the woods by myself and like, you know, prostate or prostate, uh, postulate to the moon or yeah. something. Um, prostate. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I mean, that's an element that can come into psychedelics, you know, but oh, yeah. never mind. Um, 
yeah, that I, I think that there's there's something there too in, in assessing. But we should, it, it, you know, it, it makes sense to be cautious because we don't want to lose certain standing in our in our community or in our career or in the social network as a consequence of people being frightened um, or or judgmental as, as, or to view us through the stigma which they inherited as the consequence of how psychedelics have been represented in the modern world for the last, you know, 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's to be considered too. It doesn't make sense to bring it up in your workplace if you think it'll cause you to get fired or <laughs> sent to HR on probation or something. So, um, but yeah, not, you know, being, being courageous in testing the waters in that way. And you might be surprised um, on who you find uh, is actually in alignment with your curiosities in that sense. That's that's a great answer. I wasn't expecting. But <laughs> Got anything else, Lee? Um, yeah, I was. I mean, circling back to your work, um, can you tell us a little bit about your book and um, kind of dive into like a just a short version of what's in there and people can read. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I have two books, uh, uh, Decomposing the Shadow and The True Light of Darkness. Both of them explore the um, sort of the, the foundation of my work around psilocybin, in particular, the value in passing through and surrendering onto um, the more painful dark or uncomfortable aspects of it. Uh, decomposing the shadow gives a pretty strong, we'll say academic or scholarly model or explanation for working with psilocybin to the, for the means of personal growth, resolution of emotional repression, and what I explain in the book as, as um, psycho-spiritual maturation, okay. which is a term that I concept I still stand behind but the term I don't I don't use so much as I used to um, and then the true light of darkness explores the very same premise but whereas decomposing the shadow does so from a you know a scholarly intellectual approach hmm. um, the true light of darkness explores it through the meat of storytelling through the meal that is storytelling. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a telling of my encounters, three specific trips that I had, which um, I applied the model presented in decomposing the shadow to the lived experience of facing my own darkness um, during psychedelic trip, wherein of the three stories, each of them increases in darkness and complexity as the narrative progresses literal darkness you know from tripping with friends mm -hmm. uh, in the daytime in the first story and tripping by myself in a float tank in the third story oh wow but also um darkness in a metaphorical sense from oh you know i'm having a hard time with my career to um, yeah. i'm like well i don't want to say but the last story is like quite dark um so so those are, those are the two books. And I wrote them because for some people, what they want is just juicy ideas to chew on. And for other people, what works best for them is actually to read a story. And I actually believe that stories offer a lot more um, than intellectual um, explanations. And I'm, although I wouldn't say that I've given up on writing heady intellectualized content in any way, <laughs> I, I feel really curious about the power of storytelling to share ideas and to share whatever slivers of wisdom I might have earned in the in the years that I've I've lived and in whatever years I, I should um, I I would be so blessed to continue to live. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, I guess I have two different questions. What is your? Um, sounds like you've used multiple different types of psychedelics. Um, reading your blog. Um, what is your? most um impactful um type of hallucinogen that you've used and maybe why and then um what do you see as the future of psychedelic use in um say in the western world well those are two very different questions um 
Well, every psychedelic that I've taken has been impactful. Um, some of which I found myself a lot like the the wake, <laughs> the wake of those psychedelic experience were more turbulent or, or more impactful. Certainly my work with um, psilocybin has obviously been very impactful. My work with ayahuasca has also been very impactful, though in a, in a less clean way, certainly <laughs> less clean. Um, I mean, literally, like I got it all over me. Um, I, you've taken ayahuasca, so you probably know yeah. what I'm referencing here. But, um, but also LSD has been very impactful as well. And same with, you know, all the other ones I've tried, they've been very impactful. It's the ones that I've explored more deeply that of course would have a greater impact because I would go deeper and deeper into the potentials of that experience each time I would go. Do you find yourself, do you find yourself like a building type of relationship with um, the psychedelic itself maybe? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in the same way that I might, um, you know, build a relationship with coffee or build a relationship with, um, with a particular writer, right, for example. Um, and then there are some ones that I've tried specifically, it's like, what is this letter number combination going to do for my subjective experience? Uh, and some that I've tried that have been like, that was interesting not entirely sure you know the value of this other than that was interesting um like it wasn't immediately relevant at least not enough so that i would want to keep exploring like 2ci for example that was a very interesting experience a couple times that i've tried it um but i wasn't exactly exactly sure outside of an interesting experience what the what the value of it was for me um but then again maybe it just also depends on the person right for some people, certain certain molecules are like that's the ticket. Um, and then, sorry, what was your second question? Oh, the second question is like, what do you see as the future of um, psychedelic use and and how it's um, possibly changing like Western society? Mm. You know, I have I have a way that I've answered that question previously that might have some value now, but I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I'm feeling so enthused by that answer. <laughs> um, I think it could have, it could have a really positive effect because at the very least psychedelics ask us or invite us to ask different questions about what is happening and what are the nature of things and that in and of itself might be really positive to break us out of certain insular ideological frameworks to consider something else now that's a that's a that could be a slippery slope because the thing that we could be considering could be increasingly detached from the you know the very real responsibilities we have as humans alive right now in a very troubled time um, socially, politically, ecologically, um, and it could be, you know, pretty quick that psychedelics make us prioritize spiritual ascension and our own personal enlightenment, our own personal growth to the point wherein nobody can actually ask us for any real help on anything that has any relevancy to the world that goes beyond us because we're too obsessed with ourselves and my spiritual evolution, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, and insofar as the way that they are definitely coming in now in medicine. And I think it's not a far stretch to step from medicine into uh, philosophy. It won't, I don't think it'll be very long before the next wave of, um, of psychedelic research will be in, in, um, in the academic field of, of philosophy, which is a great place for it, I think. Uh, that as it, as it steps in, in medicine and you think about, you know, what is the impact of a person who's never taken psychedelics, who's depressed and, you know, lives in the conventional world and they have a psychedelic experience. They have a, you know, psilocybin occasioned mystical type experience inside of a therapeutic container. Mm -hmm. And that now informs 
or for some time will inform their experience of life and will be the thing that's on the tip of their tongue when they're interacting with others, when they're interacting with their family, the impact of it, if not the literal explanation or, or re-encount, um, recounting of, of the experience. And then if we imagine what it might be like if that type of therapeutic treatment became so normalized that a vast majority of people who are suffering from depression end up going through psilocybin therapy, excuse me, rather than um, um, the tricyclic antidepressants and that um, even it becomes normalized for nicotine addiction. And instead of getting on the patch, you take some psilocybin in a therapeutic container. And as that becomes more normalized and less stigmatized, what does that do? What is the impact that might have on the quality and content of discourse in the general public sphere? Great and question. Without, right, without actually saying what that might be, I believe that it could be very positive. Yeah, definitely. It could be very positive, especially if those things, if, if those experiences are held in a very grounded way, which inside of the current established therapeutic containers, it is in a very grounded way. Now, I don't think we should stay too grounded for too long because then we'll just grind our way back into another rut. But um, I, I, I do see that there, there could be some really dramatic value there. Nice. Definitely. Well, thanks, man. That was a great, uh, that was a great answer and it was kept it wide open. So we'll have to see what the future hold, beholds, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's also so, um, um, a great note to end on. Um, is there anything else you get you left lingering in your mind before uh, we leave the, the, the uh, listeners today? Mm. Well, every time or any time I am mildly unprepared and, and I just like, shoot arrows into the air and hope they all land at bullseye i um i feel a little apprehensive about whether or not i spun a bunch of uh yarns that you know wove an itchy sweater that nobody will want to wear uh but other than that i feel great i'm glad that uh, you guys invited me on the show maybe i could do a little uh uh invitation for people to follow me definitely yeah, yeah definitely. so um ooh, i hope that loud sound didn't just come no through, we're, but... it's good man don't worry about okay. it we can edit um, it out if it have to. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, if people would like to follow my work, um, jameswjesso.com is where it's all contained. Like, even um, I'll put up a blog post that features this uh, this interview when the time comes. Uh, and you can find there my writing, my podcast, my uh, links to my YouTube channel. I do smaller videos. Right now I'm working on a video about death and dying. Um, which, you know, talking about ego death and talking about actually dying, mm -hmm. that'll be coming out pretty soon. Um, to follow me on social media, just look James W. Gesso at James W. Gesso. Primarily it's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram right now. Um, and if people would like to come see me on tour, depending on when this podcast released, you can do so by um, checking me out, jameswgesso.com james w gesso.com sometimes i don't announce yet my words uh <laughs> slash events to see where i'm going to be and when and uh yeah and oh and you can find my books that's a lot of things and you can find my books on amazon but all you have to remember is james w gesso.com that's where it all is awesome <laughs> easy easy enough man yeah. well thanks so much for uh, spending time with us i know you're incredibly busy with getting ready to tra travel and so i appreciate you coming on spending time with us thank you yeah, cheers. I appreciate that you guys uh, invited me to have on. I saw some of your other speakers. I, I noticed that you had James Orock uh, just recently on the show. He's he's an excellent character. So it feels good to be a part of the, the established alumni so far. And I just want to congratulate you guys on on making the effort to have another um, another angle of approach being brought into this topic uh, for the public record with this podcast. So kudos to you guys for that. If you enjoyed this episode of Cosmic Echo and would like to hear more about James and his work, you can visit our website at taleeaters.com backslash podcast, and there you can click on links that will take you to his book as well as his website. 
Additionally, if you enjoyed this podcast and would like to support us, you can do so through our Patreon page located at the same site. We look forward to bringing you additional episodes in the near future, but until then, happy dreaming.